Hey everybody, Charlie Sabidio here from Sabidio Cylinder Head Development. Uh, David Vizard asked me to do a quick video on the E7 heads that we dyno tested a few years ago actually. We had uh, eight cylinder heads, eight sets of cylinder heads that went on the same dyno on the same short block. Some of the things I'd like to talk about first are if you attempt to do a project like this on your own, some things that are absolutely needed. And I, I should say, even if you don't do it yourself, if you're having a professional do it, some things he absolutely better have, or you really should be looking for a different cylinder head guy. One is the flow bench. Can you do cylinder heads without it? Yes. Did it for many years without a flow bench. Stuff I did was pretty good. As a matter of fact, these cylinder heads are copies of ones I were doing in the 90s. And uh, they flow right around 220. CFM on the intake, right around 160 on the exhaust, and I was able to you know, reproduce them and flow them, and so I know what the, the old ones did years ago. The old ones on a 306 ran about 11 seconds, 11.0 at 128 miles an hour on street tires with, poor, with a poor 0 to 60. Uh, some of the things you're going to need, either you're going to need or your cylinder head guy is going to need. Flow bench. See if you can get up. A good ultrasonic gauge. This is made by Dakota Ultrasonics. A small diameter wand, long enough to get in and out of the ports. I wish I had a smaller tip, but at the time I bought this, they didn't have one. Dakota does not uh, send me any money, but FYI, if you call them up, talk to one of their engineers, they'll take a hundred bucks off when you buy that. That's actually a very good company. The other thing you desperately need, heat tubes. Pito, Pito. Okay, this is to measure your airspeed. Curved is for your intakes, straights for your exhaust. Absolutely need to have these to figure out where the air is flowing, where it needs to be larger, where it needs to be smaller. The other thing, flow balls. Flow balls interrupt the disruption in the airflow and tell you what's going on at that point. As soon as you put it into a spot that we have very high flowing air, you'll see it right away. You'll drop on your manometer and your CFM will definitely go down. DV wanted me to talk about textures a little bit. I'm not going to do a demo on textures. When we do the close-up on the cylinder head, you'll see the texture that's there right now. The texture that's there right now, I use this burr. This burr is actually quite old. And if I can bring it close enough to the, the screen, I grabbed the wrong one. This is the newer version. The older one has got all kinds of pieces missing out of it. But it's a double cut carbide on a six inch shank. David calls my golf ball texture is actually a bunch of little scallops taken out of the out of the iron or the aluminum. This burr, this burr I love. This is a high helix burr. I get all my burrs from Buckeye Carbide. This is an excellent metal removal tool. Iron or aluminum works great. Buckeye Carbide doesn't pay me either, but they do. They make an excellent product. This monster I have, single cut, believe it or not, works just great on, on iron. Put a little WD-40 on it, works fantastic. The secret to using any burr on an electric grinder is you need speed control. Yes, you can use a rheostat type speed control. That's fine. I don't use that. I have one, but I don't, I don't use that much. What I use is an SCR drive for DC motors that is literally infinitely adjustable from 0 to 999. I may do a, a video on that in the future if there's any interest at all in it, or if there's any interest in the, doing textures, I may do that in the future. Okay, this is David Vizar's chamber design. He did one chamber and one intake port and one exhaust port, sent me the head, I did the rest. And I copied his chamber design pretty much exactly the way he did it. Uh, when we were all done doing the porting, I asked him if I could improve the porting if I thought I could. He allowed me to, and that worked out well. I didn't change his chamber design at all. It has a, quite a bit of a scallop on this side. Actually, these have a little bit less than the ones that he dynoed. These are not completed heads, just so you know. Okay, these are still in the 
development stage, I would say, because they're only flowing around 220 right now, and I'd like to get a little more, but these castings are a little on the thin side. I think they had a little bit of corrosion, and they have a little more core shift than the set I did for, for David. So, as far as the chamber, this gets scalloped out a little bit right here. This gets rounded right here around the plug boss because you want the airflow to come out over this part of the chamber. And this has a curve here as well. This has been relieved, we can say, almost softened towards the edge. And that's because when the air is flowing through the port, it's going to come out towards the center, okay? So you want it to flow towards the center as easily as possible. It also doesn't hurt the swirl because Fords are a little bit low on swirl. So if you give it a little kick in the butt as far as swirl, you'll pick up more low-end torque. It doesn't seem to have a, a negative effect at high RPM, but it certainly helps low RPM. The other section is this this section here that the chamber is actually lowered, rounded. Uh, this, I remember doing this in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, I originally saw uh, Grumpy Jenkins was doing it on his drag engines. David Weizard also does it. David also doesn't like much metal removed right from here. Um, certain cylinder heads I completely agree with David other cylinder heads I do not agree with David it also depends on the cylinder head and that's one of those things once you cut it though you're stuck with it so on these cylinder heads I leave this just the way it is literally if I could just make the top cut go right to the corner that'd be great but you can't because there's not enough room okay a quick test on the Sonic if you take a look at the little graph in the corner the more you get on the graph, the better the signal you have, the more accurate it's going to be. All right, that's pretty good right there, 116 thousandths. So that's about a tenth of an inch. That's pretty decent and also about as thin as I would like to go, especially on the intake next to the exhaust port. Okay, that is a serious issue with these heads. The way the port turns okay it's all the way up here and it turns this dog leg right most of the air would like to come straight out towards the center a lot of it does follow this wall high speed wise does but a lot of it likes to follow this wall as well and when you get get in on the bench and you start flowing you can measure the air speed on both sides the closer you can get the air speeds on both sides of the bowl will help okay this dog leg, you take as much out of this dog leg as you can on these E7s. Problem is, casting thickness. Must watch for it. These are actually cut for 194 intake valves. I do not think that's an optimal size for the E7s. I think you could probably do a better job at 1.85 intake valves because the short side radius has water right under it and it's very difficult to get the short side radius to feed that part of the intake valve. This is the texture that David Vizard was talking about. If you can, we can get the camera in close enough, you can see it actually is tiny scallops. Now, we can get in lots of arguments about textures and what they do and what they help. The point is, it's very small percentage of your basic flow. The shape of the port is really gonna make the big difference. Like Chad says, shape is king. Do not disagree with him at all. He's right on the money. Okay, quick look at the exhaust port. 125 thousandths. Some guys may run it a lot thinner than that. That would not be me. I would rather err on having a little bit thicker casting. That is one of the problems with the E7 exhaust. It's not nearly wide enough across the bowl. So... It's nice to take a nice chunk out of this side because the exhaust gases like to come through at an angle, right? So if you scallop this out, the, actually the 289 heads are much better than this because they have more meat there. You can take some out. I do not like to make it much thinner than 125 thousandths. You can get a decent shape. I actually machine the, the boss right out of these, but I also use K-line guides. If you use K-line guides and size them properly, and hone them, 
they will not wear out. I don't care what anybody says. You will not have valve seat recession. You use K-Line guides because they will, they will not wear and they'll be right on the money. And that's why you get valve seat recession. It's, not, it's from guides more than anything else. All that unleaded gas and so forth, hardened seats, most of that was due to guide issues. And as far as the valve job on this, this isn't quite done. I actually like to use the burr and bring a radius right up to my 45. Alrighty, short side radius is a problem. Yeah, you see this one is already 94 thousandths and it does not have the shape that I would really like it to have. That is absolutely limiting flow on these ports right now. I would love to knock that back a little bit more, even maybe even lower it a little bit. I do not have the metal to do that. Could I push it thinner than that? Yes, I could. The problem with doing that is all you need to do is have the burr jump one time and you'll pop right through a thinner casting. Not worth my time. I can't even tell you how many hours are into these castings already. It's ridiculous. Are E7s even worth working on? Only if you like to do sleeper stuff. That's my opinion. If you take a look, take a look right over here at that cylinder head. See that aluminum? That is a Chinese aluminum that I'm doing for a friend in California. I think it's a Promax. Very minimal porting, well over 315 CFM with a 202 valve. Can't compare that to an E7. Come back here. E7, about all you're going to get is maybe 150 cc on the ports. That comes with a 185 cc port. By the time you're done, it's not even 200 cc's. And you're flowing that much, that much. In fact, I'm willing to bet it's probably 194 cc's the way it is, flowing over 300. So that could make some serious horsepower. These make excellent torque for what they are because of the smaller port. Hey, this is Charlie. Just trying to do a fill-in for my last video that nobody could see the the burrs we were using. See if you can see now. All right. That is not my super old double cut, but that's getting there. My really, my really good uh, double cut that gives the really nice finish is way more beat up than that. There is the high helix burr that I love so much. That's a half inch diameter. And this monster, I think, is about a three quarter diameter single cut. I use it on steel and I use it on, on aluminum. You can see the uh, pitot tube. You can see our flow ball. You can see my PR8 sonic tester. And let's see if we can get some better, better views of the ports and the finish that DV wanted me to show you guys. Okay. This is actually an older, an older port job. You can see where I went over, and it still has some rust in spots. The valve job is not finalized. Okay, you can see DV's chamber a little bit better now. I hope you can see where it's taken out here, and it's radius here, right? You can see the top over here. Where it's been machined flat so it it goes into the port a little bit easier it's actually tough to do while you're holding the phone okay change the lighting a little bit now you can really see the shape of the chamber a little bit better okay a little bit different view so we can see the short side radius uh, you can still see that it's a little bit higher than i would like it does not, it is not laid back nearly enough. You can see the valve job is not finalized. Okay, you can take a quick look at the exhaust bowl from the chamber side. Let me back like that. Okay, now we put a little backlight on it. A little flashlight to die in. But you can see how it's, the outside wall has been had, uh, material removed so and the whole the whole port is really angled 
towards the center of the chamber, which it should be. Okay, I had to backlight that, and I actually used a paper towel, blue paper towel, to uh, mellow it out a little bit. You can see a little bit of the shape of the port as it's going down. It's it's a little tough. Oh, I can't even keep my finger on the light. Not completely finished, but you get an idea of what it looks like. Okay, and here's the floor. Like I said, this is not finished. But you get an idea of what needs to be done on it. Would be nice to make the floor wider at the short side radius. Just does not have the metal to do that. Okay, the exhaust port. You can see how it's been kicked out on the outside of the cylinder. And if you look at the center, it's actually angled from the valve seat towards the port in the angle of the the direction of the flow from the center of the cylinder out. Okay, flip the head over, take another look at it. Take a, I'm just going to go scrolling around. I have that backlit. That is not a completely finished exhaust port. It's pretty close. It's flowing 160 plus right now. I usually do a little bit more work on the uh, valve guide on the intake, and I shape it to the, the angle I want. I wanted the flow to go. That's not completely finished. You can see here how I radius around the plug boss to get better flow in and out of where the plug is, and you can see the radius out of the chamber a little bit better. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to thank you for viewing. I'd like to thank my videographer, my youngest daughter, Sophia. She's 16. She'll be editing this and hopefully making some kind of sense out of my ramblings. And if you like it, make sure you like it. Thanks so much.